Jesus Christ. Oh my what God. Is what is that? I don't know. Alex, Alex, Alex grab it. Grab it. I'm not going to grab that. Grab that. Grab you grab, grab it. it. Get in the car, Get in the car, Morty. Get in the car. Come on, Zach. Let's go to heaven. Sit, wait. Sit, wait, 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 Internet animators have come a pretty long way, from original sketches and parodies to bite-sized memes and storytime animations. Animators have found a way to make a name for themselves online throughout the years. While it is not as lucrative or easy as other forms of online content creation, this hasn't stopped passionate voices from making their own cartoons. And whether you stumble upon these videos through YouTube recommendations or by going on Newgrounds, there are gems to be found here. A traitor! Well, let's just send Gladius a message. If we can't go to them, maybe them can go to we. He's <laughs> invaded my boot. He's trying to control me. Help! <laughs> I knew you were going to do this from the moment I got out of bed today. Typical Steve. I'm not surprised. Oh, you would pull some horse piss like this. God damn it! Oh, I'll get you for this, Steve! Yet, as much as we adore the independence of these cartoons, I think we've all collectively thought that it would be pretty neat if we saw any of these guys on TV, to see what their voice would be like if they had a crew and studio money. But despite the amount of talent that has appeared throughout the years, for the longest time nothing has really crossed that threshold. Instead, established names just find success elsewhere. A web series will gain its following, be it a couple of episodes or longer, until the creators move on to something else. Hopefully with some success. If a channel is big enough, they'll launch a Kickstarter and have their fans fund their projects themselves. But having a fan base doesn't guarantee success. Sometimes somebody with sizable support will announce a project, only for it to quietly fade away from public conversation while, optimistically, the project sits in production hell. Getting something started is hard, you know, let alone getting a studio to pick you up. If an 8 million sub channel has trouble getting picked up, what more for independent artists with smaller followings? It just seemed impossible. But fast forward to now, and the landscape is starting to shift. Michael Cusack's YOLO has turned into a series. Hasbin Hotel has been picked up by A24 Studios, and now Smiling Friends is officially on HBO Max. That's a big deal, especially when the content transcends the stigma of being made by a YouTuber. You know, the type of content that only seems to entertain existing fans, providing nothing of substance to newcomers as they look dumbfounded as to how these folks gained a following in the first place. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. Joe Penna, aka Mystery Guitar Man, went from nifty music videos to making Hollywood movies. George Miller went from being filthy and pink to being showered in pop star success. And Bo Burnham went from an anxious self-loathing teen in his room to anxious self-loathing man in his room for Netflix. And now, Zack joins Michael on this list of people who've made it without the YouTuber stigma. And they've managed to avoid this stigma by creating something familiar without being derivative of their past work. Longtime fans will enjoy the familiar humor, whilst people who aren't in the know will probably enjoy what the show is offering. And the show has a lot to offer. Ow. Hey, no biting. Hey, no biting. Okay? You want me to bite you? Yeah. You know that hurts, Daddy. I told you, silly. No biting, okay? You're my good little baby, huh? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Dad, bug is sitting on a rock. Gleb runs up to the bug. <laughs> So yeah, I think this is pretty funny, to me at least. And the reason why is because of how the show takes advantage of the animation medium. 
from the goofy two-frame loops to the buttery smooth moments. The show proves its comedic competence through its visual variety. Crude drawings are funny looking without being off-putting, whilst crudeness is never a substitute for quality. Because if the show decides to flex, it can totally show off some well-animated stuff. Competence and crudeness is done with intent, and it's a matter of knowing when and where you place these moments throughout each episode. And with something like the silly Halloween special, where the show manages to flip between comedy and tension rapidly without ever feeling jarring, I can't help but applaud the show from a technical standpoint. You're gonna die in him. And if you put this on paper, jump roping between the mundane and the fantastical with the occasional scream tossed in, it sounds awful. In the wrong hands, this would be some lol random humor that would be on some kid's YouTube channel. <laughs> but if you're familiar with the duo's individual work, this is what they're known for. And they've been doing this for years. Yay, I'm gonna tickle you. <laughs> what the hell? Get off of me! <laughs> Holy sh- Oh my god! <laughs> Now, I, I just first off want to say thank you so much for having me. You're such an angel about these kind of things. You're such a sweet, kind little person, and um, it's so cool to me. It's so neat. It's such a cool concept to me that you would let me come and give me a platform like this and be able to defend myself, you know, in the sense, in the sense that, let me just finish before you say anything, because I just want to say this real quick, and I'll let you, I'll let you go ahead, sweetie. But I just want to say real quick. It's a kalutu, balata papa mba, yo coming coming chocolate, me a kapu da. Now imagine this with the support of a network behind them, where the duo get to do their own thing on a larger scale. Then you've got Smiling Friends, an Adult Swim show under their direction with a lot of care and talent put into it. You can see it in how varied and well drawn the backgrounds are, or how 3D animation, obvious rotoscoping, and a badly drawn anime lady seamlessly fits right into the show. Hell, even obvious stock footage of fire and explosions fit in for some reason. And the attention to detail in certain things is just neat to see. Like Mr. Boss's legs actually corresponding with the DDR game. Or how accurately glitchy this broken phone screen looks. It's minor details like these that make a scene or a punchline more funny to me. And whether the punchlines come from the chaos going on screen or from the more grounded conversations, the show pulls off every joke it sets up for itself. Callbacks, visual gags, and the occasional awkward moment. Shrimp, you don't need to get back with your ex, all right? You need to get your life in order. Only then, ugh. Excuse me, heavens. Uh, well, the show even pulls off scenes that don't have jokes at all. There's a scene where Pim just sings about picking up twigs. No need for mockery or a punchline. He just likes picking up twigs, and it's charming. Picking up twigs, picking up twigs. I like, I like picking up twigs. One twig, two twig, three twig, four. I like twigs and I want some more. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bird. This sincerity is a nice change of pace in between the insanity that happens. While not groundbreaking, since there's another Adult Swim show that does this sort of comedy masterfully, Smiling Friends having a scene like this helps punchlines become less predictable. A scene doesn't have to have a joke, it can just be a pleasant moment. Or a punchline doesn't have to be mean-spirited, it can be well-natured. Alright, noted. Uh... That's just straight up beautiful, by the way. So, when the show does decide to get a bit more mean... <laughs> it ends up being a well-earned surprise. And the show's unpredictability extends to how flexible their cast of characters are. Like, a character who's initially seen as a bit odd can quickly become the straight man by encountering a situation that's bizarre to him. Or how Pim is able to switch from cartoonish optimism to grounded frustration given the right circumstances. And the show is able to achieve this without Pim feeling out of character. And a lot of these characters work thanks to Zack and Michael's voice work. Whether it's the over-the-top voices or dry authenticity, it all suits their characters' personalities. And while the duo do most of the voices in the show, <coughs> the rest of the cast match their energy seamlessly. And this cast is going to be full of people you'll recognize if you've been around the online animation community for quite some time now. And thankfully, instead of purely leaning on self-referential humor, they're putting these recognizable voices in a new context that's fresh to existing fans. 
sick animations as Mr. Boss is a particular highlight for me. And while it is cool to know the talent behind the show, a person not in the know can still enjoy the show. It very much stands on its own, and knowing who did what just becomes an added bonus for a longtime fan. Like, it's neat to know that the singer during Bim's Daydream montage is the same person who sang in the Christmas Hellbenders episode, who is also the same person that sang the English opening of the Pokemon anime. Wow! And that's what I like about Smiling Friends. The essence of what I liked about these guys' work in the past are still present, but more refined. It is humor that manages to be familiar and new, unreliant of the viewer to be in on the joke in order to laugh at the jokes. Add on the show's impressive production quality and recognizable longtime collaborators, then Smiling Friends becomes a series that longtime fans of online animation have been waiting for. And speaking as someone who has followed these guys' work for quite some time now, it's been a worthwhile wait. And as the show receives praise from every corner of the internet, this becomes the benchmark that aspiring talents wish to reach, as it stands out from its contemporaries. It stands out due to its comedic quality and competence as a cartoon, whilst also standing out by proving a couple of schmucks on the internet can snag an Adult Swim gig and do it well. And the end result? It's a pretty funny show. More for me! <laughs> But this is all self-explanatory. Just about anybody could come to these conclusions by watching the show. So I want to dive deeper into something else. Because while I could go on and on about its creators, the show, and its place in the context of online entertainment, there's something else that needs to be discussed. Because buried beneath the well-executed comedy is something important, an execution of social commentary that seems to be going over the heads of most viewers. And I want to dive deep into that because I believe Smiling Friends explores the human condition in such a novel way that I feel it needs to be taken a bit more seriously. So while the show, deservedly, earns the praise it gets for its comedy, I think it's about time we discuss how Smiling Friends is a crash course into absurdist philosophy, and how it reinvents the tale of Sisyphus for the modern age. Be it through the title, the building, or the sound that plays when a person smiles, the act of smiling is a large focus of the show. And despite its seemingly ever-present nature, the show doesn't overindulge us with the act of smiling. In fact, there's a lot of characters who display emotions below the positivity of a smile. Because while it does seem like a good idea to have a show called Smiling Friends to have a cast that always smiles, it's a utopian concept that does not work in a narrative format. A story without conflict isn't a story, it's just a moment in time. So while a person may tune into Smiling Friends just to see some characters smile for the sake of their amusement, viewers don't receive a show that inundates them with a cast that smiles 24-7. Rather, viewers must suffer through the conflict, be a part of the journey of our protagonists to gain the relief, which is the satisfaction of a smile. Because think of the times you smile. This isn't a constant state. A smile is a reaction to stimuli, a positive signal that lets your body know that you're having a good time. But times aren't good all the time. Sometimes, the good times are outweighed by the times you felt time went on for too long. You know the times when time becomes mediocre, boring, lethargic, monotonous, repetitive, tedious, dull, unremarkable, unvaried, repetitive, uninspired, dry, sterile, repetitive, lethargic, dry, 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 repetitive, and just kinda dumb. The act of smiling is to acknowledge a shift in your life has happened, and no matter how small that shift is, as long as that positive shift produces a smile, it's your brain registering a positive change in your life. But. A smile isn't permanent, it's a fleeting moment, a high whose half-life is gone as soon as you notice it, only for your face to return back to normality. Now this, for me personally, is the hidden message behind Smiling Friends. The journey to struggle through the monotony of living in order to get that brief moment of euphoria to then be sent back down to earth, leading you to repeat this cycle. That's the message. Now, those with an educated mind may have already drawn the parallel of these beats with the Greek tragedy of Sisyphus. This tragedy is about a man who has been cursed to roll a large boulder up a hill and push it down, every day for the rest of eternity. And this tragedy parallels Smiling Friends because of Albert Camus' essay from 1942 called The Myth of Sisyphus. 
In it, he pictured the boulder as a personification of the struggles of life, having to do the same repetitive task day in and day out, acknowledging the absurdity and pointlessness of it. But this struggle isn't seen as a bad thing. If anything, one must accept the struggle in order to become happy. To quote Camus' essay, he remarks, One must imagine Sisyphus happy, as the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. Now before I go any further, I need to explain who Albert Camus is and his relation to absurdist philosophy. <laughs> Understanding all this, I think there's no other character that personifies this philosophy, this quote by Albert, that embodies all these traits better than a certain fan favorite. A character that nearly missed out a chance on the spotlight because of his radical existential stance. But Adult Swim dared to push boundaries and holds up a mirror that perfectly reflects our lives, and the character who holds this mirror to us, right to our face, is a man named Smormu. Smormu, the Sisyphus of Smiling Friends. It's probably the most important episode in the entire series, and one of the most compelling pieces of media to come out this year. And here's why. So, who is Smormu? To start things off, he is a character introduced in episode 3 of season 1, titled Shrimp's Odyssey. And he only appears in the beginning and at the end of an 11 minute and 6 second episode. So now you may be wondering, how does he deliver such a hefty message with such little screen time? It's pretty simple. Just look at the never-ending cycle of Sisyphus and draw a parallel with the viewer's experience when they first meet Smormu. So, let's get into the mind of a person who has never seen this episode before. The episode starts like this. It's Smormu! If you... Accompanied by this audio is the visual of Smormu with a smirk on his face as a yellow background literally radiates around him. This alone should already make you smile, but the show goes a step further to really sell you on the idea that Smormu is an iconic character that's really synonymous with joy and jubilation. Check out this outfit. It's loud colors and bold t-shirt that says, I'm with her. Now. Does Smormu wearing this shirt imply that he supported Hillary during the 2016 presidential election and he's unafraid of the politics he stands by, even in loss? Or does he wear it ironically, since his smile is suggesting shenanigans, silliness, and a screwball behavior? Or is he unaware of the shirt's political background and only dons the garb since it adheres to his sense of humor? Maybe he's just happy for his SO and he's unaware of the politics of the shirt when he found it in the bargain bin. Regardless of his choices, it's safe to say that Smormu is bold and confident, unafraid to share his identity to the world. Not anyone can pull off the pastel fit and velcro shoe combo together, but Smormu does, and he does it with unwavering confidence. Confidence reinforced by the measurement of his head and how he postures himself. Total dominator behavior. Now put this all together, it then becomes objective fact that Smormu will elicit a smile out of you. If not, you're wrong. Here comes the part where things get interactive. The narrator chimes in to ask a critical question. He asks you, the viewer, if you want Smormu to be the fifth smiling friend. Given this is the third episode, you, the viewer, were probably already tired of the main cast. And you, the viewer, have seen everything that these characters were capable of, and you said to yourself, it's time to shake things up. And shake things up the show did. Smormu comes in, loud and proud, and if his charms have worked on you, your fingers will feel compelled to text the word Smormu to the number presented on your screen, validating your choice. If you oppose Smormu, you really have to go out of your way, typing, no, I really, really, really don't want Smormu. There are very many reasons as to why people may decide not to opt in on Smormu. I'll admit, Smormu's boldness can be a bit daunting, and the inclusion of sharing one's politics can be a bit off-putting. Or maybe, you're racist. Regardless of your reasons, to oppose Smormu is going to require a strong volition and an attention span long enough to concentrate and type these words out. So, imagine this. You've casted your vote. A vote, mind you, that's associated with strong feelings. So, what comes next? 10 minutes of no smormu. This, to be frank, is quite distressing. What you thought would be a landslide win has you in complete confusion. And as the episode plays out, you've essentially gone through the seven stages of grief because of what seemed to be promised never seems to arrive. So there you are. 
paralyzed. Attempting to enjoy the episode, except you feel you have been robbed of an experience that you've invested time and effort into. And while the episode is good, the rage and disappointment that lives in your heart starts clouding your judgment. But you don't know where to place these emotions. So these emotions that have nowhere to go just sit within you, festering into something more painful. And to quote Dr. Melfi in Season 5 of The Sopranos, which is a show that the series takes heavy inspiration from, depression is a rage turned inward. That's what hits you. Depression. As you fall into this near inescapable emotional valley and your newfound ickiness resides in your gut, you feel like all hope is lost. That you're ready to give up the struggle and burden we've sat through that all stemmed from this false promise. But then, it hits you. Reality creeps in to save you from darkness, and you finally see the thing you've been waiting for this entire time. Smarmu. And then he says this. Don't worry, Pim. I can cheer you up. It's Smarmu! His presence both works diegetically and non-diegetically, which is a stroke of genius. This achieves being a fourth wall break without actually breaking the fourth wall. Because when you zoom out on your personal journey of this episode, it turns out the struggle and relief you experienced parallels Sisyphus's eternal torment. And remember that quote, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart? Guess what? Smormu is that height, and he very much filled up our hearts. By introducing Smormu early on, this creates an expectation for the audience, as a fog invades their mind to cloud their judgement throughout the episode as they're awaiting the presence of Smormu. By asking us the question in the beginning, this forces us to actively participate in the Smiling Friends program. And in the internet age of TikTok compilations, Instagram stories, and Quibi originals, participation demands instant gratification. But Smiling Friends rejects modern conventions. It pushes back on the status quo and makes us work for our enjoyment, because gratification without the struggle makes the highs impotent, a stream of mildly positive consciousness that is used to distract rather than engage, and the Shrimp Odyssey episode is the definition of emotional engagement. And while this comparison may seem like a stretch, just look at the title of the episode, and look at the second word, Odyssey. In which classic piece of literature mentions Sisyphus, Book 11 of the Odyssey by Homer? Clearly, this comparison and allusion to Homer's work isn't just mere coincidence. Furthermore, this Odyssey, from tease to absence to reveal, this speaks to the optimistic message that Smiling Friends is trying to share with us. Take a look at the pie charts, showcasing the results of the electoral and popular vote. While the electoral college votes no, winning by hair's margin, the show ultimately sides with the popular vote. And in the age where the college can overrule the wishes of the people, and in the age where doubt and mistrust and fake news have poisoned the well of America's psyche, Smiling Friends offers us an optimistic future. Not a fantastical, unrealistic future, but a grounded future where if things were to go right, this is what the future would look like. Very Star Trek, very cool. Because the show's entire goal is not just to let the characters in the story smile, but to make us smile as well. Which makes the border between reality and fiction thinner and thinner. Which may culminate in the great merge in the not too distant future, but that's a story for another time. But the point that I'm trying to make is that Smiling Friends is a reflection of reality, but ever so slightly tinted. While not as true as a mirror, the reflection reflects nonetheless. Underneath the umbrella of Smormu, the Sisyphus of Smiling Friends, is other forms of social commentary that the show nails down. Check out these examples. The ever-presence of the Meep name-slash-brand is a critique on the capitalistic system. Did you notice Meep Cinema, Meep Eat, Meep Boulevard, and the Meep Foundation? Meep represents the unavoidable corporations that have seemed to grab a stranglehold of our lives. So ever-present and everywhere where it feels invisible. While not as overt in their critique as, say, The Boys' Vought or Mr. Robot's E-Corp, the criticism is still biting and very much present. Now check out Grimm and Gnarly, they're seen as antagonists blocking our hero's goals, but the conflict they exude is an inevitability- But the conflict they exude is an inev- But the conflict they exude is an inevitability and a necessary part of our lives. Conflict and resolution, remember, is what storytelling is all about. Yin and yang, light and dark, chaos 
and control. And only when we start understanding the chaos within us will we be able to take full control of our lives. And what about Mr. Frog? He's quite a dense character. He's clearly inspired by the self-help book Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy, coupled with some overseas influence. While not necessarily a critique, he's more so an expression of the show's knowledgeable background. For example, referencing Eat That Frog is a clear flip of the script of the self-help book. Instead of eating the frog, Mr. Frog eats other things. It's a metaphor. And Mr. Frog's design, being inspired by work overseas, means inspirations aren't always inspired by the things you thought they were inspired by. Look at this comparison. Both end their sentences with a certain phrase, and the art styles have some surprising similarities to the trained eye. And it may seem like that Mr. Frog's design borders on plagiarism when you put them side by side like this. This was done on purpose. After all, the show has done this multiple times. Anyway, when you take these two inspirations as a whole, it clearly shows that Mr. Frog is a mixture of cultures, forging a new path for entertainment in this world of increasing globalization. And Mr. Frog's Western self-help basis with an Eastern aesthetic is one that's worth welcoming and praising. And finally, Erica Lindbeck, who voices Futaba Sakura in Persona 5, plays Jennifer, who ends up with Shrimp the Gamer. This connection proves that women do, in fact, play video games, and seemingly hopeless men like Shrimp can find true love. So when you bundle all these facts together, you can start to see the easy to enjoy but complex to understand narrative that courses through smiling friends. The show's setting is a masterclass of taking reality and reinventing it into something abstract yet familiar. This transformation rivals works like Game of Thrones or Disco Elysium, as this show's universe is full of meaning waiting to be dissected. Because even the characters with the smallest screen time can have the biggest impact on the show's meaning. So let's circle back to Smormu and how he sits within the context of entertainment media. He very much fulfills the mentor archetype, specifically the type of character to provide guidance and therapy for our protagonist. And while shows tend to have scenes of the protagonist and their therapist play out over the course of several minutes, Smiling Friends dares to be different. The show attempts to have Pim's emotional catharsis happen right at the very end, via Smormu's rendition of the Arabian Riff. Smormu performing this song is a great example of show don't tell, because it speaks to Smormu's cultured and well-educated background. And for those who don't know, the Arabian Riff has its roots back in the late 1700s, which means Smormu is invoking a technique that has put on a smile for people for literally centuries. It's a classic, but not an overplayed one, and given the Arabian Riff has many permutations depending on your source, this becomes a point of concern when performing the classic tune for someone. So, do you take the high-risk, high-reward approach, attempting to achieve the maximum giggle by choosing a version that'll definitely speak to a small but passionate audience? Or do you choose the safe bet, evoke the theme of the Arabian Riff to elicit an emotional response? but not choosing a specific song to maximize personal connection. Smormu, evidently, chooses the safe route, and whether he picked this or that, his actions evoke an efficient and novel way to illustrate conflict and resolution that gets introduced and resolved at the same time. Except the conflict isn't resolved. What should have been a slam dunk in Smormu's routine is instead prolonged as Pim stays in a state of dissatisfaction. But despite Pim's down demeanor, Smormu continues with a smile on his face. This proves the genius of smiling friends. The Sisyphean condition that every living being, be it human, animal, whatever, and everything in between, must experience once their consciousness has emerged from our psyche and confront the reality that not only will we die one day, but the heat death of the universe will eventually happen. Heaven cannot save the universe, nor will reincarnation be viable to sustain one soul once every single star has died out and every black hole vanishes. All that will be left in the universe will be the void, the great nothing. Satan's plump hole. But before that happens, the smiling friends are here to make our momentary reality a pleasant moment. A moment where we acknowledge the absurdities of life, laugh at the face of death, and enjoy the life we were given because as wacky as death is, life is just as wacky. It's a struggle, but a struggle worth pursuing because the reward just might be worth it. One must imagine Sisyphus happy, says Albert Cumstein, but we don't have to imagine, we just have to live in order to experience that ourselves.
Having referenced Albert earlier and how his essays relate to the show, it's safe to say that Smiling Friends is a cartoon that explores the philosophy of absurdism pretty well. Reality is twisted, tinted even, and bizarre looking. The characters look distorted, the unexpected happens, and we just kinda go along with it because that's reality. But despite the chaos the world tosses to us, we still find a way to smile, even knowing the grim end that we'll all eventually experience. An experience that the show likes to constantly remind us by the end of every episode. And as well lived his life was, Swarmo still ends with him petrified in fear. These end cards, despite the feel-good resolutions that happen in each episode, is a grim reminder of reality. It's bold and frightening, rivaling the likes of Synecdoche, New York. But there is a silver lining to this. And while some of the dates seem to not happen yet in our reality, as a way to create a joke of some sort, these dates actually imply that Smiling Friends actually takes place in the future. And the future it showcases is one full of optimism, love, and care. And to live life to the fullest, one must acknowledge the absurdities of life. So, to truly acknowledge and embrace life, to partake in this reality that Smiling Friends has painted for us, I'd like to take a moment of silence for Smormu and pay my respects. Remember, while the show is a distorted reflection of reality, it's reality nonetheless. So please, if you're compelled to, please join me in a moment of silence for Smormu. Goblin Corn on Plate.